As the Whitechapel murders increased in ferocity and number, the newspapers began to devote more and more column inches to reporting on the case. People's reactions to what they were reading varied enormously. Some responded with anger, not only towards the miscreant responsible for the crimes, but also towards the authorities, in particular the police, whose inability to catch the perpetrator was the subject of an awful lot of press criticism throughout September and October 1888. Others became wary, even fearful of the monster lurking in their midst, and it was noticeable in the immediate aftermaths of each of the murders that the streets of Whitechapel became deserted after nightfall as people opted to remain indoors for fear of the Ripper. Still others, however, became mentally unstable as a result of what they were hearing and reading about the crimes, and, although almost all of them had underlying issues, it is apparent that the press coverage of the Whitechapel murders impacted negatively on their mental health, often with tragic consequences. Here are the stories of ten people who were, quite literally, driven mad by Jack the Ripper. The Reading Mercury, on Saturday the 15th of September, 1888, carried the story of a lady who, on reading an account of the murder of Annie Chapman, was, quite literally, scared to death. The article read, On Tuesday afternoon, Mrs. Burridge, a shopkeeper of the Blackfriars Road, was reading an account of the Whitechapel murder, and she was so affected thereby that she fell down in a fit and died. Four days later, the Hackney and Kingsland Gazette reported that the particulars of a shocking case of suicide have reached Dr. MacDonald, coroner. About seven o'clock on Monday evening, a butcher named John Thomas Hennell, aged 29, of 76 Enfield Buildings, Hoxton, was seen to enter his room looking very strange. He is a widower, his wife having died only weeks since, leaving him with three little children. When his father, who lives in the same block, entered the room half an hour later, he was horrified to find his son lying on the floor with his throat cut almost from ear to ear, while close to his side was a large butcher's knife with which the deed had evidently been done. A doctor was sent for, but the man died in a few minutes. Since the death of his wife, the deceased had been very despondent. At the inquest into John's death, his father testified that his son had lately been complaining of pains in his head. According to the Star newspaper, it was also stated that the deceased had repeatedly expressed the fear that they were after him for the Whitechapel murder. The jury returned a verdict of temporary insanity. A less tragic case was reported by the Shields Daily Gazette on Thursday the 4th of October. At the Guild Hall, London, yesterday, William Bull, describing himself as a medical student at the London Hospital and living at Stannard Road, Dalston, was charged on his own confession with having committed the murder at Mitre Square. Inspector Izzard said that at 20 minutes to 11 on Tuesday night, the accused came to his room at Bishopsgate Street Police Station and made the following statement. My name is William Bull. I live at Dalston. I am a medical student at the London Hospital. I wish to give myself up for the murder in Allgate on Saturday night or Sunday morning. About two o'clock, I think I met the woman in Allgate. I went with her up a narrow street not far from the main road for an immoral purpose. I promised to give her half a crown, which I did. When walking along together, there was a second man who came up and took the half crown from her. I cannot endure this any longer, my poor head. Here he put his hand to his head and cried, or pretended to cry, I shall go mad, I have done it, and I must put up with it. The inspector asked what had become of the clothing he had on when the murder was committed. The accused said, If you want to know, they are in the River Lee, along with the knife I threw away. At this point the prisoner declined to say more. He was drunk. The prisoner gave a correct address, but is not known at the London Hospital. His parents are respectable people. Inspector Izzard asked for a remand so that he could make inquiries, and this was granted. The prisoner now said that he was mad drunk when he made the statement. He was remanded. 
William Bull next appeared in court on Friday the 5th of October when, according to the next day's edition of the Leeds Mercury, Inspector Izzard informed the court that inquiries had proved that the prisoner could have had nothing to do with the Mitre Square murder. Alderman Stone, presiding, told Bull that he regretted that he could not punish him for the trouble he had caused and dismissed him. On Thursday the 11th of October, another suicide occurred that also appears to have been influenced by the murders. As tragic as all these cases are, this one is particularly moving. The Scotsman newspaper carried a brief report on the tragedy under the headline, A Victim of the London Murders. The accompanying article read, Mrs. Soddo the wife of a Spitalfields weaver living in Hanbury Street near the scene of the murder of Annie Chapman was found yesterday morning to have hanged herself from the banisters of her house. She had been much excited and affected by the circumstances attending the murder. The Morning Advertiser, on Friday the 12th of October, published a more detailed account of the circumstances leading up to her death. The particulars of a case of suicide which took place at 65 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, a house a few doors away from the spot where the unfortunate woman Annie Chapman was murdered, reached Dr MacDonald, the coroner for North East Middlesex, yesterday morning. The top floor of the house in question is occupied by a silk weaver named Soddo, his wife and their child aged eight years. For some time, Mrs. Soddo has been depressed, and since the perpetration of the Whitechapel murders, she has been greatly agitated. On Sunday, a razor was taken from her, as it was thought she meditated suicide. On the following day, she appeared to be more cheerful, and was left with her child. On Wednesday, however, she left her room, saying she was going on an errand, but when some time had elapsed and she did not return, her daughter went in search of her and found her hanging from a rope attached to the stair banisters. The child ran for assistance, and eventually the police were called in and the body cut down. Life was then extinct. Sadly, this would become a double tragedy when, according to a report in the Morning Post on Thursday the 10th of January, 1889, Yesterday, Dr MacDonald, the coroner for North East Middlesex, held an inquiry at the Black Lion, Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, into the circumstances attending the death of John Soddo, aged 52, a silk weaver, lately living at 65 Hanbury Street, who committed suicide on Sunday morning last. It appeared from the evidence of Charles Soddo, the son who lived with his father, that on Sunday morning they lay in bed till noon. His father got up first, and as he was leaving the room, he said, I shall be back in a minute. I am only just going downstairs. A few minutes later, one of the lodgers ran upstairs and told the witness that his father had hung himself. He went to him, but he had then been cut down and was sitting in a chair, apparently dead. Since his wife's death three months ago, his father had been greatly depressed and had often said that he could not live without her, as life was but a trouble to him, and that some morning they would find him as they had found her. The witness's mother committed suicide by hanging shortly after the murder which took place in Hanbury Street in September last, she being greatly affected by it. The jury returned a verdict of suicide while temporarily insane. The Daily News on Thursday the 18th of October carried an account of a woman whose mind had been affected by reports of the murders to the point that she was convinced that she would soon become a victim herself. At the Thames Police Court yesterday morning, the Divisional Surgeon of Police and the Relieving Officer asked the magistrates to sign the necessary papers for the removal to an asylum of a woman whose mind appeared to have been affected by the recent murders. The doctor's certificate stated that the woman whose name is Sarah Goody, aged 40, a needlewoman living at Wild Street, Stepney, had told him, the doctor, that she was followed about by a man who watched her movements and who intended to do her harm. She was in such a terrified condition that she could neither eat nor sleep. The lunatic attendant stated that the woman declared that she was followed about by murderers who intended catching her. On one occasion she asked her landlady to see if there was any writing on the shutters. 
Mr. Lushington signed the necessary papers. The Cardiff Times on Saturday the 15th of December published details of a case that was disturbing not just for the way in which it impacted on the mind of the victim but also in that it makes you wonder what the motivation for the actions of the unknown miscreant could have been. Not long ago, a young lady who lived at Prince's Gate, London, went to see some friends in Dover Street, and on returning home she noticed that she was being followed by a man whose appearance, to say the least of it, was not attractive. He spoke to her, whereupon she jumped into a hansom to be driven home. The man also got a hansom and gave chase, and just as she got to her father's house, he got out, and coming close to her, he whispered in her ear, this is your first warning. I am Jack the Ripper. The poor girl almost fainted and was only just able to rush up the step and knock at the door. Her father at once gave information at Scotland Yard, and under the advice of the officials, the young lady was recommended to go frequently out with a view of seeing the scoundrel again. On all these occasions, she was accompanied by detectives who were in cabs or were on foot, but the man was never seen. At length, as the affair was passing out of her mind, she attended a ball at Aldershot, wearing a fur cloak, which was left in the dressing room. On going to fetch it after the ball, she discovered a note pinned to the lining, bearing the words, This is your second warning, and the last. I am Jack the Ripper. The girl went immediately into hysterics, and has since been completely out of her mind, and she has been removed to an asylum. The police do not suspect for a moment that the coward is the author of the Whitechapel murders, but they do believe that he is a man who has either some unknown spite against the girl, or he is a cruel practical joker. The antics of another Jack the Ripper impersonator, this time in Mullerbrack in Ireland, that had unforeseen consequences, were reported in the Sheffield Daily Telegraph on Thursday the 10th of January, 1889. The headline read... Jack the Ripper joke, a girl driven mad. According to the article that followed, a Bambridge correspondent telegraphs that some time ago a young girl named Martha McMarran of Mullerbrack, when in bed, was much horrified at seeing, standing at the bedside, a person dressed as a man, brandishing a weapon and crying out, I am Jack the Ripper! The girl never mentally recovered from the shock, and yesterday the police found it necessary to take the poor creature into custody. After being medically examined, she was pronounced a dangerous lunatic and was removed to Downpatrick Asylum. The perpetrator of the joke proved to be a female friend of the unfortunate girl. One cannot help thinking that, with friends like that, who needed Jack the Ripper? On Saturday the 27th of April, 1889, the Globe carried the story of yet another unfortunate person whose mind had become affected by the murders with tragic consequences. An inquiry has been held at Edmonton into the circumstances attending the death of Robert Hyron, aged 62, a shoemaker lately living at a common lodging house in Whitechapel who committed suicide in a most decided manner on Easter Monday. Sarah Moench of 78 Wellington Road, Bow, deposed that the deceased was her brother. She last saw him alive in the Edmonton Union ten weeks ago. He was suffering from acute mania caused by the murders perpetrated by Jack the Ripper in Whitechapel, close to where the deceased was living at the time. These frequent murders occurring as they did near to the place where he was living unhinged his mind. The knife produced belonged to him and was used in his business. Besides the murders, there was nothing to account for his madness. In November, he wandered away from Whitechapel and was found in a dying condition in a field at Edmonton, whence he was taken to the workhouse. Police Constable Albert Kite, 338N, deposed that at three o'clock on the morning of the bank holiday, he was on duty near Union Lane Gate when he heard groans and a little further on discovered the deceased lying in the road, almost smothered in blood. The witness called Dr. Jones, who said the man was nearly dead. An ambulance was procured, but the deceased expired as they got to the Union Gates. The deceased was known as Mad Jack. 
Inspector Ainsley deposed to being called by the last witness and finding the deceased lying in the road with a large gash in his throat. Close to the spot he found a bag of shoemaker's tools, while in the grass at the side of the road he found a knife covered with blood. Dr W. Jones of Upper Edmonton stated that he was called on bank holiday morning to see the deceased. He was pulseless and cold and on the point of death. The wound in the throat was deep and severed all the arteries. He died a few minutes later. The jury returned a verdict of suicide while temporarily insane. Our final case in this litany of tragedy was reported by Lloyd's Weekly Newspaper on Sunday the 5th of May under the headline, Distressing Suicide of a Young Lady. According to the subsequent article, Danford Thomas held an inquest on Monday respecting the death of Annie Masters, aged 22, lately residing with her parents at five Clarence Gardens, Regent's Park, whose body was found in the Regent's Canal on Saturday. A brother of the deceased stated that his sister had for some time past been strange in her manner and occasionally very depressed in spirits. She imagined that she was a burden to her parents and fancied that people had turned against her. Six months ago, her sister became mentally afflicted and this troubled the deceased very much. A short time ago, she consulted a fortune teller who told her that her sister would never get better and further affirmed that Jack the Ripper had been in the neighbourhood and would probably get hold of her. The deceased was greatly upset by these statements and three weeks ago she mysteriously disappeared from home. On Saturday, a boy saw the body in the Regent's Canal near the York and Albany Bridge and the assistance of the police was obtained. The medical evidence was to the effect that the deceased was mentally weak and the jury returned a verdict of suicide while temporarily insane. And so, our roundup of people whose lives were ruined and in several cases ended by the terror and panic that the reporting of the Whitechapel murders generated draws to its conclusion. Each case was a tragedy, not just for those whose mental health was affected by the crimes, but also for their families who had little choice but to look on helplessly as their loved ones succumbed to their demons. And although mental illness was undoubtedly mostly to blame for the large proportion of these cases, it has to be acknowledged that the way in which many of the newspapers were reporting on the case also played a part. As the Echo newspaper put it on the 18th of October, 1888, sensational journalism has much to answer for.